Um, actually, that's as Christoph um, put, put it, so he, he gave me the title. Um, uh, but, but what I really want to deal with is try to um, attack the sort of reductionist ideas of the financial crash, whereby everything is put down to a single cause, the, you know, greed in financial markets if it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, uh, people on the Justice and Peace Commission, or um, for that matter, um, mismanaged monetary policy in central banks when it comes to a, a certain uh, breed of uh, Miesian and Austrian economists. I think the, when catastrophic events occur, like the financial crash, normally there are a number of causes which come together at the same time to um, create the difficulty. Now, having said that, I'm not going to use the flip chart. I will just use the flip chart at the beginning. Um, because um, I, I think as, as believers in a free economy, it is actually reasonable to point out that even if the banking sector and the financial sector were entirely free, that it really was a, um, a, a capitalist um, system, and um, that financial crashes are an unavoidable, uh, an unavoidable consequence of a free financial system, it doesn't look that bad. So if you go back to the sort of um, beginning of industrial history in the United Kingdom in, say, 1700, and you plot um, national income per head until, um, uh, say, 2010, then you get a graph that looks something like, something like this. And that might be the financial crash. You know, I'm happy to trade this, quite frankly, for um, this huge increase in um, uh, national income that's arisen uh, since the expansion of trade, the expansion of a business economy uh, more generally, even if it is true that um, financial systems in free economies are um, unstable. Um, now, there are good reasons that, uh, for, for Christians to support a free economy that have been discussed already. It harnesses human in initiative um, to promote the common good in the economic sphere. However, if it is true that uh, um, uh, capitalist economies are prone to catastrophic financial crashes which bring about human misery in their wake, uh, we mustn't forget, actually, despite what I've just said here, the, the um, extent of the human misery, particularly in the Great Depression uh, in the United States, then it is much more difficult for us to make the case um, for a free economy. Not impossible, but it's more difficult. On the other hand, if, as I shall argue, the market economy was distorted um, in ways that benefited particular interests within the economy at the expense of the common good in general, then it's not really the, um, a free economy or a capitalist economy as such which uh, will be found guilty. Um, but these processes of regulation and these, these other aspects of the economy which are designed to benefit particular uh, interests. But I'll come to a judgment at the end. Before I um, do that, I want to discuss rather um, a number of competing views about the financial crash. <laughs> Same problem as yesterday, yeah. Something happened yesterday, didn't it? And then all of a sudden, it yeah. Okay, right. Let's go. Now, the typical view in uh, Catholic circles is that you had unregulated, uh, particularly on continental Europe, that you had unregulated laissez-faire capitalism that was allowed to let rip as a process of deregulation um, took place, and that you then had unrestrained greed, which led to huge amounts of risk taking in the financial system, and then the financial system uh, collapsed. That's not entirely without truth, but uh, it's an extremely naive uh, explanation of, of what happened. And I want to go through, in turn, a number of other factors which I think uh, were extremely important in explaining the financial crash. And the first of these is government monetary policy, the way in which central banks behave. It's now widely understood that um, the boom and bust which culminated in the Great Depression in the 1930s arose as a result of catastrophically mismanaged monetary policy, especially in the United States. And the same is true of the Japanese boom in the 1980s, followed by the bust and long malaise in the 20th century. So before we start looking at other causes of the financial crash, I think it's reasonable to look at whether excessively loose monetary policy, by which I mean central banks keeping interest rates too low, um, printing too much money, and so on, um, turns out to be an important cause of the financial crash, and I think it does. So for six years from 2001, the US Federal Reserve 
And we should remember all the time that the seat of the crash really was in the United States. Um, other countries were affected, but the, I think the seat of the, the crash was in the United States. The US Federal Reserve effectively sent the message to market participants that if security values fell, um, if the stock market fell, then the Fed would cut interest rates in order to underpin stock market values. And um, in addition to this, loose monetary policy led to a big financial bubble, an asset price boom, low saving, and a boom in consumption. And this has an, um, a, a series of really quite um, serious effects in the financial system. So for example, if there's an asset price boom, that raises the value artificially of the collateral against secured loans. So I go to the bank, I um, take out a mortgage which is secured against my house, the bank says, well that's okay because the mortgage is only is $150,000 and your house is worth $300,000. Well if that house value is artificially inflated because of loose monetary policy, then the bank is potentially undertaking a much more risky loan than it really um, believes it is. Um, and in addition to this, uh, a concept known as mark to market uh, to to accounting, whereby banks used accounting, um, used, used um, uh, stock market values, market values uh, when they constructed their balance sheets, uh, um, led banks to believe that they were making much higher profits than they really were during the financial boom of the early 21st century. Uh, early 21st century. And um, th they would then make bigger distributions, uh, expand their balance sheets to, to a greater degree, um, uh, lend more to consumers, and, and, and so on. And this all exacerbated a general problem of global imbalances around the uh, world economy. Now, it's tempting to think that these are just technical issues, that, um, that that's, no, these are sort of dry issues which only economists are interested in. And if only the people had behaved ethically, then the whole thing wouldn't have happened. The problem is, it's actually quite difficult to discern what ethical behaviour is when a central bank is distorting markets in these ways. If I'm a banker and somebody comes to me for a loan and um, their house appears to be worth $300,000 um, and they ask for a loan of $150,000, it may seem quite prudent of me to lend them um, that, 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 that money. Um, so I'm being sent false signals by the central bank about the reality in which I'm uh, operating, which makes it much more difficult um, for people uh, in, in the field to discern what prudent behaviour is. Also. If the central bank is keeping interest rates too low and that's leading to a boom in consumption and people's incomes are growing, they're likely to borrow more because they expect their incomes to grow more in the future. Again, um, you might blame them for imprudence. You might suggest that they should save when their incomes are rising uh, for a rainy day, for when things go wrong. But if they have seen their incomes rising for several years and they expect their income to carry on rising, that's actually a reasonable uh, decision on their part. So when you get central banks um, loosening monetary policy in this way, distorting the market, it becomes much more difficult for um, people to behave in an ethical and prudent uh, way. Now, there are a lot of people who would argue that it's only really the behaviour of central banks which caused the crash and nothing else. But actually, there are a lot of other problems going on within the um, financial system as well. And the first of these, in indeed, as a whole category of, of things really, is the way in which the US government underwrites risk in the financial system. So uh, I'll, I'll give several examples of this, but it's a really deeply rooted problem. You have the so-called capitalist land of the free, and actually you've got a government which says to banks, it says to borrowers, um, if you borrow money, the government will bail you out. It's a kind of welfare state, if you like, for the financial system. And um, so one example of uh, this is the way in which um, the government-backed mortgage agency, uh, Fannie Mae and, and its partner Freddie Mac, had a commitment to spend $2 trillion expanding home ownership among low-income earners and minorities, all of which was uh, underwritten effectively by the US government. 40% um, of the loans which these two government-owned um, corporations uh, securitized and underwrote in 2007-2008 were subprime loans or what are known as Alt-A loans which don't have um, proper uh, documentation. So the government here was setting up uh, a huge securitization warehouse, a huge financial institution 
which was effectively underwriting loans to people who were not going to be able to afford uh, to repay them. At one point, these institutions, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, had leverage of 100 to 1. In other words, for every pound that they lent out, or every dollar they lent out, uh, sorry, the other way around, for every um, $100 they lent out, they just had $1 of equity capital. Now, it's interesting, actually, you, you could go and look for this on, on the internet. Um, one or two people have mentioned Stieglitz and uh, the way in which Stieglitz is courted in certain circles, uh, um, including in, um, the, uh, in, in the Vatican. There's a, there's a report which is public, which Stieglitz wrote uh, with a couple of other co-authors in 2005, where you can find the sentence, um, there is, given their current levels of capital, there is a probability of one in half a million, in other words, he carries on, practically zero, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, will require support from the government. So Stieglitz is hardly uh, a prophet. He uh, predicted that what happened catastrophically couldn't possibly happen. And it's worth looking that out, in fact. Now, uh, in, in addition to all this, there was the problem of um, um, the encouragement of subprime lending uh, by, uh, through regulation through what is known as the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, which required banks to be very careful in not discriminating against low-income people when providing them with loans. And if banks were found to discriminate against low-income people, and banks should be discriminating uh, between people when offering loans. It's, it's precisely the um, function of a bank to discriminate when making loans and then to monitor those loans. If banks were um, found to be discriminating, they would be subject to huge fines. In addition to this, um, we've, had, we've always had very weak personal bankruptcy law in, in the US and what are known as non-recourse mortgages. In other words, if I take out a, um, a loan to buy a house, let's say the loan is $100,000 and the house is worth $150,000, and then the house value falls to, say, $80,000. Now, in the UK, if you do that, um, you're, you're liable as a borrower for that $20,000. You can't just walk away from your debt, leave the bank with the house, and, um, and, and um, leave the bank with the problem. But in the US, you can. You literally, if the value of your house falls below your, the value of your, uh, the debt to the bank, you can literally put the keys in the door of the house, um, uh, walk away, and leave the bank with a problem. And bankruptcy law encourages um, that type of thing. Not in all states. It differs, it differs between states. But in about half of uh, st um, US states, there are what, what is known as non-recourse mortgages, allowing the borrower to walk away from the property and walk away from the debt um, uh, should, should the value of the collateral fall below the um, value of the debt. Furthermore, since 1933, I, th I think it is, you've had deposit insurance. Of course, you have deposit insurance in, um, in, in most countries. Now, in the US, deposit insurance system was set up so that um, banks would pay risk-based premiums. In other words, the more risky was their behaviour, the bigger the deposit insurance premium they would have to pay to the federal deposit insurance um, uh, organisation. But these risk-based premiums were never altered. So banks that behaved in more risky ways ended up paying exactly the same deposit insurance premiums as other banks. Um, ju just, just to explain, in case you're not aware, deposit insurance um, is provided in most countries, and indeed it's mandatory um, in European Union uh, countries, in order to try to alleviate the perceived problem of runs uh, on banks. So if I put um, 50,000 pounds in a UK bank and that bank um, becomes illiquid or insolvent, then um, instead of me losing some of my money, if the bank has to be wound up and it can't pay um, all its debts, then the, the deposit insurance organisation will make sure that I get the full 50,000 back. And that reduces monitoring by customers. It raises uh, moral hazard, especially when those banks which are more risky don't pay higher premiums for that deposit insurance. You also had a continual bailing out of the US financial system um, from the 1970s onwards. I'll explain a bit more about this uh, later. But in the 1980s and early 1990s, you had the huge savings and loan system, which was bailed out by the US government. Um, then in, um, I think it was 19, 
1998, you had the failure of long-term capital management, uh, which is a huge hedge fund. Now, whether that was bailed out is something of a, of a, of a moot point, um, but nevertheless, it certainly had some government support. And the, the US financial system got used to the idea um, that um, if there were to be a big catastrophe, the government would uh, do something. Um, now, these problems were noticed. It's not as if um, the, 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 these, uh, the people who've been complaining about these things uh, started complaining about them after the financial crash. In particular, it's interesting to note that um, in 2000, eight years before the financial crash, um, the, the Times, British newspaper, uh, said that Alan Greenspan, in this policy of keeping interest rates low and always reducing interest rates when um, the stock market fell, the Times said that Greenspan was encouraging a destructive tendency towards excessive risky investment supported by hopes that the Fed would help if things go bad. Now, I just want to say an another um, word about um, uh, 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 bailouts, because this is really, I think, at the crux of the, of the whole thing. There is dispute amongst those who believe broadly in a free economy as to whether you should have central banks at all. Now, if you do have central banks, their function, or one of their functions, is to support um, a bank within the banking system which is temporarily short of funds, but fundamentally solvent. And this is a, a convention which goes back to the mid-19th century in, 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 um, in Britain, which was defined by uh, one of the editors of The Economist, a guy called uh, Badgett. And um, the... If this function is to work properly, then it's absolutely uh, clear that a central bank shouldn't provide support to a bank which is insolvent and illiquid. It should only provide support for a bank which is fundamentally sound, but for some reason cannot get liquid funds. And um, the, the um, Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Richmond, which is part of the whole US Federal Reserve uh, banking system, has commented uh, as follows. In a series of incidents beginning in the 1970s, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, in cooperation with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, intervened to limit bank failures' uh, effect on creditors. Early interventions were relatively small, but they established precedents that led to potential creditors to expect to be rescued in future instances of financial distress, uh, which weakened their um, incentives to limit borrower risk-taking and vulnerability. Government lending programs um, often appeared to stabilise markets because they confirmed hopes of intervention and so have been hailed as successes. But this has come at the cost of moral hazard, greater risk-taking and greater instability down the road. Now that is part of the Federal Reserve um, system, the, the central banking system in the US speaking. It's, it's uh, admitting that from the 1970s onwards, the central bank in the US was playing a greater and greater role supporting banks which were fundamentally um, failing, thus raising moral hazard and encouraging um, recklessness. <coughs> now, um, so these, these sorts of interventions, they reduce the discipline of uh, people working in the banking system, um, they reduce the discipline of customers of banks who no longer feel the need to uh, monitor banks to, to decide whether or not the uh, bank in which they're, with, with which they're doing business is, is sound. Um, but it, it also distorts um, the price signals in, in quite, uh, price signals in quite a serious way. So what should happen if a bank is beginning to um, get to a position where its assets is, are very close to its liabilities is that the cost of um, providing uh, funds to that bank particularly the, um, the interest rates on the bonds that banks issue, should start, to, should start to rise to reflect that increased risk. If people expect bailouts, uh, and that's really useful information, should be useful information to regulators and useful information to market participants. Now, if Bank A is um, uh, having to borrow at an interest rate of 10% and Bank B is having to borrow at an interest rate of 4%, that's telling you something about Bank A, that, it's, that the market regards it as risky. If the government is always promising to bail banks out, then Bank A will not have to borrow at 10%. It will have to borrow at a much lower rate of interest. 
and you lose that crucial information that's communicated um, to the market. And the worst aspect, I think, of everything that happened in the financial crash was that um, um, not just that, well, equity holders in banks tended to lose all their money, but the worst thing that happened was that the other providers of capital, bondholders, uh, got bailed out in the way that they did. <coughs> now, um, this isn't just speculation that uh, if you have a banking system which is better disciplined, which is not uh, bailed out by um, the, the government, you'll have better outcomes and you'll have a more prudent banking system. If you look at the history of the UK banking system um, from, uh, say, about 1870 to 1970, you will see that it was very highly capitalised. Banks did not expect to be supported by the government and they kept high levels of, of, of capital. They developed special systems in order to um, ensure that more responsibility was put on shareholders. Um, some of the banks were unlimited liability. So if the banks went under, then the um, shareholders of the banks would be liable for, um, uh, to make extra payments in order to compensate uh, other creditors. Before the US deposit insurance system um, began in the 1930s, US banks usually had equity capital of between 20 uh, and 30 percent. After the US uh, deposit insurance system began, from that point, US banks never had capital of more than um, 10 percent. So, whatever view you take about the financial crash and um, regulation, you cannot argue that this was a free market in financial services and banking. It was a highly regulated market, and it was a, a, a market in which customers and banks were extremely uh, protected from their, um, uh, the consequences of their, their own actions. <coughs> now, a competing um, uh, explanation, uh, maybe it's a complementary uh, explanation for the crash, uh, is that greed, and we can think of greed in a sense as being disordered uh, self-interest. Greed has run wild and caused huge amounts of instability. And uh, this effectively brought down the banking system. Now, there's certainly no question that a market economy functions better and serves true human development better when there is good moral behaviour. Caritas in Veritate commented, uh, for example, that without internal forms of solidarity and mutual trust, the market cannot completely fulfil its economic function. And, and, and that's true, and economists have done work which demonstrates that the higher is the level of mutual trust within a society, the better are um, economic um, outcomes. Um, if people don't trust each other, we can't rely on people to pay other, others what they owe, um, people begin to renege on debts or other contracts, then uh, people are much less likely to make um, long-term economic arrangements uh, with others. And if they do uh, make long-term economic arrangements with others, they will ensure that those economic arrangements are defined in a very, very long and detailed contract which can be arbitrated in a court of law. Now, there are some, and this view is certainly uh, prevalent on the Justice and Peace Commission, who believe that in financial markets um, you have a, an inherent tendency for greed and instability to take root, which will lead to financial crashes. But the opposite is also the case, um, or, or rather, I would argue that the opposite, that, that the opposite is the case, rather than uh, that, that position uh, being the case. In a market economy, um, a market economy is effective very often at nurturing good human attributes such as trust, good timekeeping, professionalism, concern for others, and so on. And this used to be particularly true in the financial centre. If you look at in the financial sector, if you look at the development of finance in Holland and Britain in the 17th and 18th centuries, there developed a whole range of institutions which were based on mutual trust. And if you didn't keep the rules, you were kicked out of those institutions. You had an incentive, in other words, uh, to keep the rules. Those institutions encouraged moral behaviour and the practice of virtues. So from the early days of modern stock exchanges, for example, in the mid-18th century Amsterdam and um, a bit later in London, those who were not trustworthy were just excluded from the, um, uh, from the exchange. And by 1923, the motto of the London Stock Exchange became, my word is my bond. 
Now, this doesn't sound like um, a, a financial market in which there was uh, recklessness, mistrust, and, and all those other things which people often believe financial markets uh, tend towards. However, the fallen nature of man means that we cannot rely on the market entirely to generate and nurture the necessary uh, values. And I think a very good um, a passage in Caritas in Veritate where uh, Pope Benedict was reminding us that there's nothing intrinsically wrong with finance, financial instruments and financial markets, um, but it's people themselves who need to be called to account um, uh, is, is this one here. It must be remembered that the market does not exist in the pure state. It's shaped by cultural configurations which define it and give it direction. Economy and finance can be used badly when those at the helm are motivated by purely selfish ends. Instruments that are good in themselves can thereby be transformed into harmful ones. But it's man's darkened reason that produces these consequences, not the instrument per se. Therefore, it's not the instrument that must be called to account, but individuals, their moral conscience, and their personal and social responsibility. And that's very typically Benedict. There's nothing intrinsically immor immoral about a CDO mortgage securitization, uh, but you can do immoral things with them. Just as there's nothing intrinsically immoral about a gun, but you can do immoral things with guns. Now, we have this problem then of um, the fallen nature of man. That may lead, um, in certain circumstances, particularly if we don't have a good moral culture, um, to financial markets becoming less satisfactory than they otherwise would. Perhaps people uh, in the early tw 21st century did begin to behave in ways uh, which were unethical and so on. And whilst I would argue that this was not the cause of the crash, it may lead to some problems. What should we do about it? Well, in particular, we should ask, should we regulate financial markets in order to try to compensate for this problem of selfishness and greed, which might, might be um, pervasive. Well, I think there's a, there's a serious problem, which um, I, certainly I think Benedict is very, very well aware of, not quite too sure that, others, uh, that, that, that those in the Justice and Peace Commission are quite so well aware of, that you can't use a human institution to perfect another human institution. Human imperfection is everywhere. So you can't assume that if you set up a regulatory bureau to deal with these nasty, horrible, greedy, selfish people who work in financial markets, you will be able to resolve um, the problem. Firstly, we can't assume that the um, motivations that lead to malfunction in financial markets are absent in regulatory uh, organisations. Individuals within regulatory organisations can also get carried, carried away with the same sort of euphoria that exists um, in financial markets at times. And this was very clear in the financial crash. Regulators had no shortage of powers in the early 21st century in Britain, America, uh, America and elsewhere, but they didn't use those powers to rein in um, the behaviour of um, uh, participants in financial markets. And in fact, nearly every action they took made matters worse uh, rather than better. Secondly, regulators can just often follow what is in their own self-interest, their own disordered self-interest, and discharge their duties rather than by wise supervision of financial institutions, simply by writing bureaucratic regulatory rules. Um, I think we probably all know people who, uh, um, or we, we, we all know, uh, about the functioning probably of one regulatory institution somewhere or another, and very often this is how they function. They believe they discharge their duties if they simply write rules. And if you look at the regulatory rule book um, uh, in the US, post Dodd-Frank, it's probably going to lead for this relatively small area of financial markets, lead to about 30,000 pages of um, uh, new regulations. Um, regulators, and I'll talk about this a bit later, can get captured by the um, um, institutions that they're trying to regulate. And um, this is a well-known problem uh, in, in economics. If you have a lack of virtue in general, one reason why regulators can't deal with that is because 
those nasty, horrible, greedy, supposed people in financial markets will do their best to make sure that they influence the regulator in ways such that the regulator um, that, that does not rein them in or, or in fact actually does them um, more favours. Um, regulator, regulators also crowd out um, market responses to problems that you get in financial markets. And there's a very good book on this subject by Jonathan Macy, um, who's a lawyer at um, uh, Yale University, and he talks about how since the development of financial regulation in the US in the early 1930s, um, investment banks no longer used their reputation as a marketing tool. So before the 1930s, um, customers of investment banks knew whether this one had a good reputation for fair dealing or a good reputation for this, that or the other, or had a bad reputation. Those which had bad reputations would find it more difficult to get business or their business would be on worse terms. But since the regulation of financial um, uh, institutions began in the 1930s in, um, in America, the use of regulation, uh, of reputation rather, by financial institutions as a marketing tool has um, fallen away. Finally, um, regulators simply don't have the knowledge to be able to um, remove the imperfections of markets to develop regulation which will actually necessarily improve matters. If, if, if you have a malfunctioning market, the, um, the problem is, as a regulator, you don't know actually what to do to make it function better. So you often see uh, within markets that, um, uh, that regulated markets, that regulation actually exacerbates problems rather than improves them. And that was certainly true in financial markets. And I'll come to one or two examples later. Now, the English and Welsh Catholic bishops produced a document before the 2010 general election, which is actually one of the best um, pre-election documents I've ever seen of, of, of um, this type. B bishops are um, inclined to uh, produce documents before elections in order to um, sort of guide the faithful as to what they should, not, not necessarily which party to vote for, but what considerations they should take into account before voting. And um, this, this document, which our bishops uh, released in 2010 is, is ri was really pretty good. And one of the paragraphs there said, um, in, in that document said, in place of virtue, we've seen an expansion of regulation. A society that is held together just by compliance to rules is inherently fragile. Open to further abuses, will be met, which will be met by a further expansion of regulation. And this is true. And this is, uh, no, cannot be denied that that has happened um, in uh, financial markets and um, I think you know, it's, it, it ele very eloquently makes the point that you cannot correct for a lack of <coughs> virtue, a lack of ethics through uh, government regulation. It's just simply not the right tool to deal with the, if, um, the, with the remoralization of society uh, that is necessary. I mean essentially God made one type of human being he didn't make one type of human being that works in financial markets and a different type without all its imperfections which, work in, uh, which works in a regulatory bureau. Now, so what was the church's official response uh, to the financial crash? Well, this was produced by the Justice and Peace Commission. Uh, actually, um, it, this postdated Caritas in Veritate. I think it would have been much better if the church had just left things at Caritas in Veritate. Um, but there was a further paper on the financial crash uh, published by the Justice and Peace Commission, I think, in, in 2011. And this very much fell on the side um, of those who believed that the cause of the crash was unrestrained greed uh, and um, liberalist um, tendencies uh, creating um, uh, uh, unrestrained uh, uh, free markets. Now, I think this was a confusing document uh, in many respects. So the document, for example, stated that um, liberalist tendencies encouraged the authorities to allow the failure of Lehman's, which then led to, uh, and actually identified this, it made a, a, a sort of technical analysis of that particular event. Um, so that liberalist tendencies allowed the, um, the, the, the failure of, of Lehman's, um, which then led to the uh, catastrophe which, uh, which followed. Now this is a pretty bizarre interpretation of events. Uh, in fact, not only were there a number of um, financial institutions which were bailed out before Lehman's um, was allowed to go, 
But the underwriting of credit risk by the US government, as I've explained, in almost every part of the financial system, you know, demonstrates that uh, it just simply isn't true that you know, free markets were left free reign with institutions being allowed to, to, to fail uh, and, and so on. For 30 or 40 years, the US financial system had been um, underpinned by the central bank and the US government. Allowing Lehman's to go was very much the exception and not um, the rule. Secondly, the documents, um, oh, sorry, just, um, the document mentioned uh, rather oddly that uh, inequalities, because it was nothing to do with this issue, uh, are growing ever wider, which is always dropped into any Justice and Peace uh, uh, Commission uh, document, but as I said last night, is just simply factually not true. Um, secondly, the document proposed a taxpayer-funded international bank uh, bailout fund on an international basis. Now, surely this is folly on a grand scale. Um, both justice and good economics, I believe, demand that we find safe ways to ensure that financial institutions that get into trouble fail. If we had a worldwide bailout fund, that worldwide bailout fund would, of course, only bail out very large institutions, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and, and so on. It wouldn't deal with small institutions. So essentially, you'd be um, reducing the risk of investing through large institutions compared with small institutions. And that is part of the pre-existing problem. It reduces the cost of capital to um, large institutions because they know they'll get bailed out as compared with small institutions. And it then makes it inevitable, actually, that those large institutions will grow ever bigger at the expense of small um, institutions. So I think this fails a test uh, both of justice and of economic um, common sense. Um, the document then proposed an international financial regulatory uh, authority. I haven't, I haven't talked about international financial regulation, but there already is a huge international financial regulatory system through the Bank for International Settlements, and I think it would be difficult to argue that that system did not make things worse in the crash rather than better. And it made it worse for two reasons. One is that the specific technical detail of the international banking regulation that we had encouraged amongst banks the development of very complex instruments which hid risks in balance sheets. There's technical reasons why that is the case. But the other thing is that if you have an international financial regulatory system so that all banks in all countries are regulated in the same way and you get that regulatory system wrong, then what's going to happen? All banks in all countries are going to be vulnerable at the same time. And in this, that's actually what happened in, if, you, if you look at the financial crash. Those countries which came out relatively better, such as Canada, didn't actually abide by the uh, Basel um, Bank for International Settlement Rules. They, they used a, a different approach to regulating their banks. So having an international financial regulatory authority um, kind of makes it much more likely that if you do have a crash, you'll have a crash on a grand scale because you'll get everything wrong in the whole world uh, all at the same time. Um, it also calls for a body that coordinates exchange rates. But uh, uh, again, if you look at events such as the um, exchange rate mechanism crisis in um, Europe in 1992, where the British government lost £10 billion, if you look at the development of the Asian uh, uh, banking crisis in, 19, in the late 1990s as well, that largely came as a result of government attempts, to, they, they both largely came as a result of government attempts to coordinate um, exchange rates and keep them at unsustainable uh, levels. So I don't think that was a very sensible recommendation either. So I feel that when, with regard to this document, I'm, I'm afraid that the Commission has just gone outside its areas of, of competence and suggested some um, solutions to the problems uh, that arose in the financial crisis uh, which would make matters much, much worse. Now, Christoph has asked me specifically to address the issue of whether or not the market was kidnapped by uh, what are often called crony capitalists. Uh, now, this is, this is an important issue not just in the banking sector. Now, when uh, Pope Francis talks about globalisation and development more generally, we ought to be uh, um, 
cognizant of the fact that in many developing countries you don't have properly functioning markets as such, you very often have um, large businesses which capture government policy and governments and big business um, together um, construct a situation which is very much to the benefit of um, government and big business which, ex which uh, reduce competition, uh, create opportunities for corruption, preferment and so on. So this, 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 this issue of crony capitalism and whether or not uh, governments and, and um, or rather or not, whether or not businesses can capture regulators and capture um, governments and make governments take policy actions which is in the interest of those businesses uh, is a, an important uh, general uh, issue that we should think about uh, as, as Catholics. It's a moral issue I should say as well as an economic issue. I, um, Michael Miller has written about this in uh, my book Catholic Social Teaching and the Market Economy. If you are running a business um, I think you can argue that it's actually unethical to try to get favours for your business uh, from, the, from the government in a sort of crony capitalist uh, type of way. But it also leads to very bad uh, economic um, outcomes. So what is the sort of charge sheet, if you like, when it comes to um, uh, thinking about whether or not the um, banking and financial markets have been captured by the big players? In the, uh, so that we didn't have a properly free, competitive, open market system, but we had a system that was controlled by a small number of special interests of regulators and government and big businesses operating hand in hand to the benefit of those um, bigger players in financial markets. Well, I, I don't need to go through this in detail because I've talked about most of them already, but deposit insurance... Um, reduces the risks for banks as well as reducing the risk for depositors. Big banks like deposit insurance because it reduces the cost um, of, of funding uh, for, for those banks. They can expand their balance sheets more. Um, bailouts clearly benefit banks' executives because it makes it much, more like, uh, much less likely that a bank will be wound up, the executives fired, uh, and so on. And bailouts are a particularly uh, pernicious problem if it is the bigger players that tend to be bailed out. Because if that happens, as I mentioned, the cost of capital to the bigger players will fall and they will be, have an unfair competitive advantage compared with smaller institutions and they'll be able to, um, they're more likely to be able to expand and actually you, you then um, make the too big to fail problem almost inevitable because you've given such an advantage to the bigger players uh, in the market. Complex regulation um, tends to benefit um, highly paid consultants, regulators and central bankers who are the only people who understand the, the regulation but it also tends to benefit once again the biggest banks. If you have complex regulation um, that tends to be a fixed operating cost um, which a big bank can spread over a, a, a larger uh, turnover whereas if you're a smaller player in the market um, the, uh, uh, that fixed operating cost is much more difficult to bear. So complex regulation tends to benefit um, um, larger players in financial markets uh, at the expense of smaller players. And as I mentioned, it's worth noting that the Dodd-Frank Act is 849 pages long and the associated regulations will be 30,000 pages long. In the UK, there are literally millions of paragraphs of financial uh, regulation. The underwriting of loans by, in the US by um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac clearly benefited borrowers, but it also benefited banks who were protected from the effects of economic fluctuation by the government guarantee. And one of the big players I should mention here is the Chinese government who had um, large investments in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and that was one of the reasons why the US government didn't want to allow them to be uh, wound up. There's that there is large amount of traffic between regulators and um, large banks, which is a, um, an indicator of crony capitalism, some would argue. And it's worth noting in this context that Hank Polson, who was the US Treasury Secretary who organised the bailout of AIG, which um, in turn probably saved Goldman Sachs, was previously a Goldman Sachs executive. And then finally, arguably, central banks, through their lender of last resort function, reduced discipline in the banking sector to the um, considerable advantage uh, of the providers of capital to the sector and uh, to executives in the sector uh, and, uh, and so on. <coughs>
So th there are other examples I, I, I could point to here, but there's some circum circumstantial evidence here that uh, at least sort of crony capitalism should be up there amongst the potential um, um, uh, guilty parties when we come to analysing and drawing conclusions. So let's draw some conclusions now. Let's come to a verdict. Who is guilty? So is it the free... Is it the free market run wild? Well, that has to be declared not guilty simply because in no sense are banking and financial markets free. The way in which governments provide guarantees, the way in which central banks throughout the 1970s, 80s and 90s supported the US banking system means that um, uh, um, banking markets were simply not free. Now, you could argue that... Um, we need all these things. We need uh, lender of last resorts. We need regulators. Uh, we need um, organisations like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, although no other developed country uh, other than the US have them, in, um, in order to correct other problems in financial markets. You could argue that these things are a good thing, but you certainly can't argue that they um, are um, characteristics of a, a free market that has been allowed to run wild. Secondly, unethical um, participants in, in financial markets. Um, well, I think that, that, that might have contributed to, to the crash. As I've already said, if governments and central banks are distorting price signals and distorting markets in the way that they were, sometimes it is difficult to discern what ethical behaviour is and what ethical behaviour isn't to the defence of those who are operating in financial markets. But there is no question that if you read the first-hand accounts of what happened in the crash, some people behaved very badly. But to conclude that unethical behaviour and nothing else caused the crash, one has got to ask the question, why did it happen in 2008? Why not in 1968? Or um, why did a, a crash happen in 1929 and not 1959? And, um, and, and, and so on. So I'm sure the lack of ethical behaviour is a problem, and it's certainly the cause of lots of particular problems in financial markets and lots of particular problems in markets in general. I don't want to diminish lack of ethics in financial markets uh, as a problem. It is a very serious problem which affects lots of indivi individuals in their daily life um, uh, all the time. But whether it's a cause of the crash, I, I think, is uh, an open verdict. Possibly contributed, but probably not the major cause. Moral hazard and perverse incentives in um, uh, um, financial markets caused by government? Well, I do think that um, we certainly had a financial system where, um, um, which acted without prudence because the discipline was undermined over a series of decades by uh, uh, government regulatory institutions and by central banks and by um, uh, governments uh, more generally. Now, most of this, um, most of these developments in financial markets have not necessarily happened because somebody thinks, oh, wouldn't it be a good idea to create moral hazard in financial markets um, so that every now and again we have a financial crash. Most of them have a, a sensible rationale, such as you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac exist in order to provide cheaper finance to allow poor people to buy homes. So I think these things are misguided, and I think undoubtedly that the build-up of moral hazard contributed to the financial crash, and in particular contributed to the way in which the crash um, happened. But it is legitimate for economists to argue about whether markets are better or worse off without these interventions. In my view, be, they will be better off without these interventions, but others can take a different um, view. Oops. Um, Crony capitalism, what Christoph asked me specifically to talk about. Well, I think we do have a regulatory system that's captured by special interests. Um, and um, there's nothing about that regulatory system which actually uh, um, made the way the crash happened better rather than worse. There are lots of things in the way uh, in which regulators um, dealt with problems in banking markets which made the whole um, uh, development of the crash much more serious than it otherwise would have been. <coughs> Whether this has happened because of well-meaning well people believing that a system which is underpinned by financial banks, which is tightly, uh, by central banks, which is tightly regulated, 
um, which it has deposit insurance and so on, is better than one without such a system, uh, such systems. I, I think one has to keep an open mind on that. I wouldn't say that all the interventions that we have in the market are necessarily as a result of the self-interest of uh, uh, large banks trying to rig the market in their favour. They might be, but they might not be. But the other thing as Christians we shouldn't rule out is just simple human error. Now, every now and again, people will make mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes will be catastrophic and things will go wrong. This will happen in financial markets and um, it may happen as a result of lack of prudence. It may happen when people make prudent decisions which just turn out to be mistaken. So uh, we shouldn't um, necessarily be overcritical when um, uh, uh, serious events happen within uh, market economies. No, bad stuff happens in a, in a fallen world. Um, and people uh, make mistakes, not just as a result of sinfulness, but just because of straightforward uh, human error, because we're all uh, human. So how should we um, respond to the um, financial crash, finally? Well, so Tezimus Annas, talking about self-interest, pointed out that the social order will be all the more stable the more it takes this fact into account and does not place in opposition personal interests and the interests of society as a whole, but rather seeks ways to bring them into fruitful harmony. And I think that's really what went wrong in financial markets, that we had a situation where the personal interest of people operating in banks and financial markets could be pursued at the expense of society as a whole because of the way in which governments and central banks would bail out institutions and individuals who made mistakes. So people could pursue their uh, self-interest at the expense of society as a whole. And we have to, we have to deal with this in, uh, in some way. And here's a, a list of potential solutions, all of which are uh, being examined by um, um, governments in different parts of the world. I think we should have risk-based deposit insurance, if we have deposit insurance at all. I'd rather get rid of deposit insurance. But if we do have it, then those banks which are more risky should pay higher premiums for it. Um, banks should have plans um, which are lodged with the central bank which, ex which explain how they'll be wound up if they should fail. So we can ensure that if a bank does fail, rather than it having to be bailed out, or rather than throwing the world into chaos, it can be wound up in an orderly way, just as a, a retail company can be wound up in, a, in an orderly way um, if it tends to go bust. Um, I think banks should have to publish more detail of um, their asset and liability exp uh, exposures, not to the regulator, who will simply sort of put them in a, a large file along with 10 billion other paragraphs of information that's provided to the regulator, but to the market. Um, and, but ultimately, the point is that we need a banking system where when you get human error, where you get imprudence, where you get recklessness, a business can be wound up in an orderly fashion and the rest of the system can go on rather than the failure of one or two institutions um, bringing down the whole of the rest of the financial system uh, with it. And I think this um, is the best way of ensuring that human nature works in uh, harmony with um, a, a market economy in this uh, field. Thanks.